Hi everyone, welcome to Adventures with Heckenback. This week we're in Hoosier National Forest doing some dispersed camping. So we thought we would share some tips for those of you who may be new to dispersed camping. When we think back to our first experience with dispersed camping, we realize we were pretty stressed. It was a new experience, we didn't really know what we were doing, and we worried about being able to find a campsite. We want our time in nature to be relaxing, not stressful though. So over time, we've come up with several tips that help to make it a more relaxing experience. So in this video, we'll share seven tips for a less stressful experience if you're new to disperse camping. Our first rule is probably pretty obvious. Do some research before you go. So we're camping in the Hoosier National Forest. So the first thing we did is Google Hoosier National Forest and pull up their website. And then we went to the camping section and then we looked specifically for the section on dispersed camping. So something interesting to know that we didn't realize at first is that when, when the websites refer to dispersed camping, there are two different kinds of dispersed camping. So one is backpacking and camping off the side of a trail while you're backpacking. That's considered dispersed camping. And then there is vehicle dispersed camping or what's called roadside camping here on the Forest Service website. Roadside camping doesn't necessarily mean just pulling over to the side of the road like you might initially think. There are a lot of campsites developed off the side of the road, and that's what roadside camping is usually referring to. Another important thing to check is the rules and restrictions regarding firewood whether you can bring your own firewood, what type of firewood you're allowed to bring, whether you can collect firewood from the national forest, and any current restrictions that are in place. You should also check the section about any bans that are currently happening. So is there a burn ban effect at the moment as well as closures of certain areas. Keep in mind also that many public lands are multi-use, so there may be people there using the land in ways different than how you intend to use it. Since we've been to Hoosier National Forest many times, we didn't do very much research, only looking to see if there were any bans in effect or closures. And if we had done a little more research, we might have realized that this is the weekend of the Gravel Grovel, which is a mountain biking course through the Hoosier National Forest. In many public lands, hunting is also allowed, so it's good to check the website for safety and information about hunting season. We happen to be here the last weekend of firearm deer hunting season. what it's his hunting season for. Deer. Deer. That way you can plan ahead like these horseback riders did so everyone can be safe and still enjoy the public lands. Our second tip is to download maps for offline use. We actually carry paper maps with us still. I love maps so I love to have the paper ones to look at. But most of us use digital maps these days. Google Maps, Gaia, Onyx Off-Road are all map tools that we use. Keep in mind though that you may not have a good satellite signal where you're going. So especially if you're unfamiliar with an area, having maps downloaded is a really good idea and a safety factor. It's often common that there will be little pockets of private land in the public lands as well. So it's important to, to be able to tell where you are on the map. 
Public lands are often huge, so explore the map ahead of time and pick out a general area where you want to look for a campsite. The U.S. Forest Service and BLM website are great sources for map downloads. And I recently discovered this map that I thought was really interesting and useful. I'll put the link to it in the description below. You can zoom into any area, open up the legend here, and it'll tell you what the different colors on the map represent. So in Indiana, we have mainly just national forest and state lands, as you can see here by the colors. But if we scroll further over to the west, you can see how much more public land there is to the west. Our third tip is to be flexible and have a backup plan. Things aren't always going to go the way you think they're going to go, and you're not necessarily going to be able to find a campsite where you're hoping to find one. So this is the area that we were planning to camp in. The most direct route would have been to come down Highway 446 here. Um, we came in from the east though instead we knew that we wanted to camp in this area one of these side roads here we ended up finding a campsite right in this area the reason we came in from that direction though is because we knew at the end of this main road is this horse camp and the horse camp allows anyone to camp in this big field that they have so if we weren't able to find a campsite, we had a backup plan of some place that we could camp for the night. We all want that epic campsite, but sometimes it just doesn't happen and you just have to be a little bit flexible. And this actually leads into tip number four, which is allow plenty of time to scout out a campsite. This is one that we personally struggle with. We always try to squeeze too much into one day, especially this time of year when it gets dark so much earlier. We thought we would have plenty of daylight to find a site, but after about an hour of driving around the forest looking for a campsite, the sun was starting to go down. And once again, of course, this can become an, a safety issue as well. You really don't want to be driving around the forest at night, especially in an area that you're unfamiliar with, looking for a campsite, if you can avoid it. Again, we're trying to reduce stress and feeling pressured to find a campsite will definitely increase your stress levels. Tip number five is kind of multi-layered. Scout the site before pulling in. Know your parking abilities and have an exit plan. Unlike more traditional campgrounds, Forest Service dispersed campsites can vary greatly in surface level, surface type, size of the campsite, obstacles in the campsite, etc. Sometimes the campsites will be fairly close to the road and you can see them pretty well, but it's still a good idea to get out and walk around them. Oftentimes, though, they'll be down a little path or a little road and you really can't see them clearly from the road. So don't hesitate to pull your vehicle to the side of the road, leave it there, get out and walk down the little path and check the campsite out. If you are camping with a rooftop tent, like we used to do, it's not as difficult to navigate smaller campsites. Now that we're pulling the Campanaw, and this is our very first time with a trailer, we had to be really aware of how to get in, whether we could get into there, maneuver the trailer with, within the campsite, um, and then that we also knew that we could get back out again which I think is something that people sometimes don't think about. Oh yeah, I can get in there, no problem. Yeah, but can you get back out again once you're in? 
logic would seem to dictate that if you were able to get the trailer in, you should be able to get it back out. When there's lots of trees though and narrow paths, it's not always that easy. Think about positioning it in a way that will make it easy to leave when you're ready. This will make packing up a lot less frustrating and stressful when you're trying to leave, especially if it happens to be raining that morning. These last two are maybe rules more than tips. So number six is don't damage the campsite or the surrounding area. I can't tell you how many times we pull into a dispersed campsite and see the trees damaged like this. I don't know what people are doing <laughs> to the trees um, for them to end up looking like this. Fire pits are actually another thing that are often damaged. Many of the national forests say that you should only camp where there is already an established fire pit and that you shouldn't establish any new fire pits. In this campsite, we could see where the original fire pit was here in the center of the campsite. A second one had been built a little ways away and you could tell it had only been used one time. We spent a little bit of time putting building the stones back around the original fire pit and kind of cleaning up where the the secondary one had been sometimes people dig holes for latrines as well or other purposes i suppose always make sure you're digging those deep enough and that you completely fill them back in when you're done they should be away from camp as well and finally, number seven, always leave it cleaner than you found it. Okay, while we're waiting for coffee, I'm gonna walk around and pick up people's trash. It's not mine. No, I know it's not yours. What I'm picking up. Look. Wash my hands, huh? It's pretty bad when somebody can't pick up their own toothpaste. Yeah. The reality is that we all want to be able to enjoy these lands for many years to come. And the more damage we do and the more garbage we create, the more of these areas are starting to be closed. Some people will never get the memo though. And so it's up to the rest of us to do what we can to keep these areas open for our own enjoyment and future generations enjoyment. You know how there's the whole thing about mylar balloons, like out in the wild, in nature, you always find all these mylar balloons everywhere. I think Walmart bags should be in the same category <laughs> as mylar balloons. If you're new to disperse camping, I hope you found some of the information in this video useful. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments. And if you've been dispersed camping for a long time, Feel free to share your own tips in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. We appreciate you and we'll see you in the next video.